In this video, we're going to begin our discussion of actual table doubling and how we can do this in an effective way. So here's a little example. We say, suppose we begin with an empty array of size two, and we must insert n elements into this array. We ask, what is the cost of performing all of these insertions if we double the size of the array every time we must reallocate memory? So this is our doubling technique. One of the best ways to understand this is to just track what happens as we go through this process of performing these insertions. Maybe we start by doing like a picture. We start with an array of size two, and then we insert something, say we inserted eight. Then maybe we insert another element. Let's say we inserted two. Then we insert a third element. When we insert the third element, we must allocate two more spaces. So we have eight and two, and then another element, let's say we had three. Then we insert a fourth element. So we'll have eight, two, three, seven. Then we insert another element. We must increase the size again. We make sure we make this the right size. We have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. We have eight, two, three, seven, one. And then we would keep doing this process. It gets really tedious to draw these pictures though, so we, why don't we narrow down our investigation to something more directly focused on what we're interested in. So instead of doing this, what we're going to do is we're going to look at a table, and we're going to keep track of the number of elements in the array and the size of that array. And when doing this, we're going to use our scheme we described above where we double the size every single time. So we start with zero elements. We then continually insert. This entire column just increases by one the entire way down. Whenever we perform an insertion and make the number of elements greater than the array size, we must reallocate memory and create a new array that's twice the size. So when we go from two to three, we increase the size from two to four. And upon doing that, we need to not only perform an insertion, we must also reallocate the memory. We will assume that the price of that reallocation is equal to the number of elements in the new array. So this new array would be of size four, and therefore the cost of reallocation would be four. A similar thing happens when we go from four to five. We create a new array of size eight. And a similar thing will happen when we go up from an array of size seven to, sorry. A similar thing will happen when we go from eight to nine. We must allocate a new array of size 16 and then of size 32 and so on and so on and so on. Now, the obvious question is, well, how do we analyze this? Maybe it'll be easier if we look at some code for performing this exact action. So if we scroll down, we have some convenient code written here. There's a lot of things in this code, so we'll try and dissect it. We're going to be inserting element X into array A. A has a size of M, and it has N elements inside of it. I mentioned a couple of those things down here in the comments. Let's look at what we need to do. Let's ignore this if statement for now. Ignoring the if statement, all we're doing is we're increasing the number of elements in the array, and then assigning the last element of the array to be X. So this is our insertion. So what is inside of that if statement? Inside of the if statement, what we're doing is we're doing our doubling technique. The way we're going to do this is create a new array of size 2M, and then we're going to copy all of the elements that we had in the array before. Then we're going to swap out the array we are interested in, A, with this temporary array, array we created, two, A2, and then we're going to set M equal to 2M. So we're doubling the size, M is the size. Now, let's quickly talk about what we're doing here in terms of the cost. So what is the cost of an insert? Well, cost of an insertion, there are two cases, and they depend on whether or not n is equal to m. So it, we have a constant runtime if we don't enter this if statement. If we don't enter that if statement, all we are doing is this simple operation down here, which is going to take constant time. If we do enter the if statement, well, we still need to do that code at the end. Plus, we need to execute all of the stuff in here. And like I said, the dominant thing, like we showed in our table, is going to be this creation of the new array of size 2m. So this is going to be c plus 2cn. I chose n there for number of elements. Because n is equal to m, I can make that interchange just fine. So this top one is if n isn't equal to m. And the bottom one is if n is equal to m. This can be helpful in making sure we understand what's happening. Sometimes we can separate this into two different things. 
uh, when we're analyzing it. So the runtime, t of n, for the, all n insertions would be, we are separating this into two different things, the cost of insertion. And by that, I mean this last bit of code appearing here. That's what this cost of insertion is. And it's not just one run of that code, it's n runs of that code. So we're going to have to keep that in mind as we're going through our analysis. And we're going to add to that the cost of reallocation or doubling. And just for completeness, let's highlight that as well to emphasize where that's coming from. So this cost of doubling here, that's all coming from this code happening up here. And note that that only happens for certain values of n as we are going through this. So let's assume that we're going to be inserting n elements and assume that n is a multiple of 2 to make our lives much easier. So t of n is equal to, if we're inserting n elements, the cost of the purple code is constant. And we're performing that same constant operation n times. So the first cost here will be cn. And then the second cost, that one's a bit more complicated. So what is the cost of the first doubling? We actually already know that because we started with two elements and the first doubling cost four. So we have four C for the first one, plus the next doubling cost eight C, plus the doubling after that cost 16 C, plus we're gonna keep going up until we get up to two C N. Why 2cn? Remember that when once we insert that last element, we're going to double the size of the array again. So it's going back up here. It's coming from this term here. So let's just for completeness' sake color this in orange to really drive home our point. So we're gonna color this orange. And now we have a simple summation to analyze. We need to do a bit of work maybe to analyze it, but it's just a summation. So t of n is equal to, we have cn, plus I'm going to rewrite the terms of that summation in opposite order so that I have instead of an increasing geometric summation, like we have right here, we want to write that as a decreasing geometric summation. So if the last size for the reallocation is going to be 2cn, I'm doubling the size to increase here, so that means the previous one will be just cn. And the one before that would be cn over 2, and so on. I'm going to go all the way down until we get to 8c and 4c. I'm now going to factor out the largest term in that summation. So I'm left with cn out front plus 2cn. If I factor that out, I have 1 plus a half plus a fourth plus, we need to be a bit careful here. If I factor 2cn out of 8c, I get 4 over n. And if I factor it out of 4c, I get 2 over n. So this is equal to, hmm. Not easy to say what's equal to, but we we can do is we can start bounding this. Everybody's favorite. So we bound this above. It is less than or equal to cn plus 2cn. That is a decreasing geometric summation. We bound decreasing geometric summations above with an infinite geometric series with the same ratios. So we have 1 plus a half plus a fourth plus infinitely many terms there. We've seen that exact summation several, several times. And hopefully we can now identify that it is equal to. 1 over 1 minus a half, which is just 2. So this is equal to cn plus 4cn, which is 5cn. We must also bound this below. We're going to bound it below in the standard way. We already bounded above by a linear term, which means we need to bound it below by a linear term. To do that, all we have to do is drop all of these extra terms over here, and that will suffice. So we bound it below by cn. Therefore, t of n would be in theta of n. Let's write that down. So t of n is in theta of n. That might not be what we're interested in, though, because that's the cost of several insertions. There may be applications in which you do that, but more frequently you're going to be doing a couple of insertions, maybe just one. And you want to know what is the cost that you expect to have out of that. The expected cost we're actually going to compute in a bit of a strange way. We're going to co compute it by finding the average cost. We know that it was cn time to insert n elements, 
So what is the cost on average? Well, the cost of one element would be the total cost for all of them divided by the number of insertions that we did. This is equal to C. If we want to be more precise, maybe we'd say 5C for upper bound. And that gives us an upper bound on the average cost. Notice that some of the insertions, if we scroll up, are going to take much longer than other insertions. And for a sufficiently large array, the probability of needing to double is going to be low on any given single insertion. However, some of them may take linear time. Thankfully, enough of them take constant time that it does not affect our asymptotic complexity. So our average cost of an insertion is in theta of one. That is much better than the one we investigated earlier, where if we did that same analysis here, we would have got our, that our average cost was in theta of n, n squared divided by n, which is much worse than our runtime for our table doubling approach. Our last thing we want to mention is that we could do the same thing with hash tables. Here is some code for doing the hash table. What we're trying to do here is ensure that our load factor in an open address hashing implementation is always satisfying the assumption that we made. We set our load factor, the number of elements divided by the size must always be less than or equal to one half. To ensure that, we're going to need to reallocate memory whenever we change the size of the hash table. So let's see how we do that. So we're gonna have our if statement check exactly like we did in the other code. We'll just have a different way we're checking. We're going to create a new hash table, twice the size. Then we're going to insert all of the elements from that old hash table into the new one, replace the, new the old hash table with the new one, and then insert the new element. Exactly the same idea. One thing that is worth mentioning here though is that the size of the hash table, which is here, it's a bit awkward because it appears in that loop variable and why don't we just insert the elements because the size, lots of those elements are empty. We do not write just one to n where n is the number of elements in the hash table because we cannot guarantee where those locations are. The one of the downsides of hash tables is that if you're searching for an element that you don't know what it is, like let's say we want to find the maximum element, we do not have direct access to that without knowing its key ahead of time. The only way to do that would be to linearly scan through the entire hash table, even though many locations are empty. So this is a bit inefficient, but it's pretty much the only efficient way we have to iterate over an entire hash table without using some other secondary data structure to help us with that. The runtime of this code is a bit awkward, so we aren't gonna do it here, but you could go through the same analysis. The cost of insertions is constant, except for in the worst case, and if you wanted to do that worst case analysis, you could. All that would change would be that this cost of insertion becomes much worse. The cost of doubling may be different depending on how you assume you're initializing your hash table as well. Typically you assume that it takes constant time to initialize the location at hash table, but maybe you have some reason to believe otherwise.